Nothing can be more important for a saved disciple of Jesus than to grow ever closer to him. That should be really our top priority, is to grow in intimacy with Jesus. Once we've been saved, we shouldn't just be satisfied with saying, well, now I'm saved, I'm good. We should really want to grow close to Jesus, grow in greater intimacy with him. We should desire to connect with our Lord and Savior. When we grow closer to Jesus, we can be blessed by his power flowing into our lives in new and, ex and unexpected ways. Jesus is ready to give us new wine by faith if we, if we simply make ourselves willing vessels to receive it. We open this morning with some disciples visiting Jesus. Only these disciples weren't disciples of Jesus. They were disciples of John the Baptist. This is in Matthew 9, 14 through 15. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. It's fascinating to read, isn't it, that John the Baptist, he, his disciples, they'd sort of formed their own group. Intriguing. And they were still loyal to him, even though the Messiah had come. And at this point, they really should be shifting away from John the Baptist to Jesus. And Perhaps that's their intention here, so not to be too critical of them. We'll read more about this, that they had their own group, when we get to chapters 11 and 14 in Matthew. And in Luke 11, 11, 1, we read that the disciples of John had their own forms of prayers even. And here it seems that these followers of John practiced fasting regularly, as the Pharisees did, much like the Pharisees. And they were sort of concerned, troubled even, that it didn't seem like Jesus' disciples were fasting. After all, they did, and so did the Pharisees. So why weren't Jesus' disciples fasting? And Jesus' response to their question was to simply point out that while he was with his disciples, they shouldn't fast. This wasn't the time to fast. And why? Because fasting is often, not always, but it's often connected to mourning, to mourning a loss of somebody. There would certainly be plenty of time to fast once Jesus had died, and although that's a short period of time, and once he had ascended to heaven, because even though he had been glorified and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he still wasn't with them. And that's, that was certainly a time to mourn, uh, missing somebody. Didn't even have to be death. Could just be that person's not with me at the moment. But even when that did happen, when Jesus ascended to heaven, his disciples could and can look forward to the bridegroom returning for his bride, which is us, the church. And now men don't get too upset about being called the bride of Christ. It's just an illustration about relationships. I know. But, you know, it's important. It's important that we're the bride of Christ because we need to be in that close, intimate connection with him. And if the groom is coming for his bride, it's important that we're part of that bride. It's from this context that we can understand two of Jesus' metaphors. And these are, these are kind of uh, interesting metaphors. They're a little bit vexing. And these are found in Matthew 9, 16 through 17. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. All right, what's happening here? You know what, I'll tell you first. If you're confused by these metaphors or these illustrations, what, what do these mean? You know, when I really got into reading the Bible as a teenager, I didn't have a clue what this meant. 
And so now they're almost special to me because of the time going, all right, and I'm glad I did this. I'd get to a part where I didn't understand the Gospels, and I would just keep reading. I'd go, okay, and I'd just keep going. And now in hindsight, I'm glad I did because I've met a lot of people that said, I've tried to read the Bible, but I got, to, I got to parts I didn't understand. So that's why I'll often say, just keep reading and maybe God will reveal it to you later, which is what I believe happened to me in this case. What is going on with the new piece of cloth used to cover a hole in an older piece of cloth? Well, it's that over time, especially if they're washed or worn together, one piece of fabric is of a different nature than the other. And of course, this is not my expertise, but my understanding is one may stretch or flex differently than another. So naturally, it won't take very long until the new patch pulls away and tears away at the old fabric. So in other words, the old and the new can't combine for long. They're not in harmony. Now this related to, we know from the context, John the Baptist. So there's some ways to look at this as if to say, well, what's going on here? Because some understand this, they'll say it's a teaching about the Mosaic Covenant or the law. Uh, it might apply to that, might apply to other things, which we'll get into, but it's almost certainly in the context related to John the Baptist. Why? Because there were these disciples of John the Baptist there, they're asking this question. This leads into the illustration. So what it represents is there was an old way of doing things with John the Baptist and the Pharisees with the fasting. And now there was this new way of thinking. There was a new paradigm. There was a new approach. And the old approach and the new approach, the new way of thinking in Christ, these two things couldn't be combined permanently. So there might be an attempt to combine the old way with Jesus, the new way, but they can't. They're not natural. They can't be sewn together without tearing apart because they're not in harmony. Jesus wasn't the forerunner of the Messiah, which is the old way, which on the Baptist, right? He was the Messiah. So don't combine the two. The ways of John were inappropriate to apply to the followers of Jesus. So it wasn't that the followers of John were wrong. They were right. But now it was time to move on. It's time to follow the Messiah. They wouldn't, if they stayed in the old way of thinking of following John the Baptist, they wouldn't be able to stay attached to Jesus. They tear away. Likewise, to try and pour new wine into old wine skins causes the wine skin to break. And that's because when the wine is in there, let's say you have some wine in an old wine skin. It's been there for a while. The, again, I don't know the chemical nature of how it's affecting the leather or anything like that. But my understanding is if I was to dump this out and then I put new wine in, that skin is not adapted to whatever the nature of the new wine is. It can often cause it to rip and pour open. So it's the same sort of principle. Applying the ways of John the Baptist to the followers of Jesus, that would lead to disaster. After all, one group is anticipating the Messiah coming and they're working and living from that position. The others are following a Messiah who's here. It's also helpful for us to remember these metaphors as they can apply to our understanding in other ways. So I think they have this direct meaning here, but you know what? They happen to work well as far as principles when it comes to trying to apply something like the Mosaic Law to followers of Jesus. So you'll sometimes meet people that says, well, we got to follow the laws of Moses, even though we're Christians. And that you really can't do that when you there's they have to start making all excuses or reinterpret a lot of the Old Testament laws because there's no way to do them in the current age, especially without a temple. So they'll always try and modify it and it becomes a muddy mess and they're inconsistent in their worldview and there's no harmony in their following of Jesus. So they're causing the wineskin to burst, so to speak. They receiving Jesus, but they're vessels that are still trying to stay with the Mosaic law. They're still trying to earn salvation and those two things don't work. So they ultimately burst and the power of Jesus pours out of them 
They can't contain it because they're not making themselves proper vessels. They're not renewing themselves so that they can receive new wine. You can't stay in the old way of thinking and receive the power of Jesus. And you know what? These metaphors also warn us of the danger of coming to Jesus, but trying to make following him fit with what we think that should mean and not what it actually means. So there's a temptation to think, I'm going to accept Jesus, but I'm going to determine what that means. So I'm going to interpret his teachings however I want. I'm going to define Jesus for myself. I'm going to make him a Jesus, so to speak, of my own creation. That can't fit. You can't receive Jesus and then, so to speak, try to make him fit your old wineskin. That Jesus won't stay in there. He's going to tear out. He's going to burst it. The two pieces of claws are going to tear apart from one another. <clears throat> Following Jesus means denying our old selves and embracing a new way, a better way, the way of Christ. Let's continue with Matthew 9, 18 through 19. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. This synagogue official, he's a man of spiritual leadership, or at least he's in charge of a local ministry to some degree that provides spiritual leadership to the community. Now, I think it's notable that he was willing to humble himself before a man who didn't have an official position in a synagogue. Now, as Jesus was traveling to visit the girl, a woman approached him in Matthew 9, 20 through 22. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once, the woman was made well. Now, this fringe on Jesus' cloak, it almost certainly refers to a tassel hanging from his shawl, probably his prayer shawl called a talit. And this tassel, this is not easy for me to pronounce, zit zit. So it's sort of this cord that hangs down from the prayer shawl. And the law of Moses, the Lord commanded the people to wear tassels. And they had a blue thread on the garments to remind them of the law. You can find this in num Numbers 15. And remember, Jesus fulfills the law. He followed all the law. He was the only man who ever perfectly fulfilled the law, following every one. So he surely would have worn the prayer shawl, at least from time to time, and would have had these tassels hanging from his garments. I know we almost never see this depicted in art. It's pretty rare, but it's almost certain he would have because first century observant Jews did wear these. Uh, maybe even if they weren't wearing the prayer shawl, they'd still have the tassels hanging down. If I had one up here, I could show you. Oh, wait, I do. <laughs> All right, here we go. Now, this is the prayer shawl itself. You might see me wearing one of these during one of our more uh, messianic type services. But you'll see these intricate tassels, these zitzits zit hanging down. And these are, we read in Numbers, are meant to remind them of the law when they see the blue color. Uh, I won't get into that much because it'll be very distracting and it'll take too much time. But there's a reason to think because the original, the Ten Commandments were written on tablets of blue stone. And the Bible does seem to indicate this. Because remember, God appeared on a pavement of blue stone. And then it says, from the stone. not So they made a connection. And then Numbers 15, when you see the blue tassels, it'll remind you of the law, God's word. So this is the sort of thing. This one's actually very small. This is, this is supposed to be so it doesn't take much work. Typically more like this. But you know what? Um the bigger ones will actually come down almost like a robe. So this one's actually, I know this is gonna sound weird. 
uh, this would be considered a liberal one. It's a little smaller, a little easier to wear. You're not being as orthodox maybe as you should. You know what, Jen, why don't we do, why don't we do a little pass around during the sermon? Let's mix it up. Why don't I throw this down to you? And you just pass it around if you want to look at it. Sure you want to throw it to me? Oh, yeah. Okay, this is That's good. Oh, good. I, mean, I caught it. <laughs> There's nothing in Mosaic Law about throwing a tallit, so I think it's okay. At least that I'm aware of. And you know what? I bring that up because I think it's nice to visualize something like what Jesus would have worn. He would have worn something like this. And like I said, he may have been wearing the prayer shawl itself. Or he might have just worn the tassels because you could wear them on other clothes. So something like this. Now we don't know what sort of hemorrhage this woman had. And the Greek is kind of hard to translate here. It looks like she had a problem with regular bleeding. Um, so evidently there was a problem where she bled regularly every so often. It doesn't mean 24-7 but something kept returning that was bleeding. In any case, it doesn't sound pleasant. And the woman hadn't been able to fully heal from this problem for over 12 years. So sort of this repeated problem where she couldn't help but continue to bleed. However, she thought that if she could just touch one of the tassels hanging from Jesus' garment, so you can see that as he's walking, there might be some behind him. As she's thinking, I don't even need to touch him. I don't even need to put my hand on him with a piece of clothes between us. If I could just touch one of those tassels hanging down, then surely I'll be healed. Now, the woman didn't think this out of desperation. And if we didn't have the very end of, with the, uh, if we didn't have Jesus' comments, I would think it might be out of desperation. If I could just touch that, I'll be healed. No, she did this out of a willingness, not out of a willingness to try anything at this point, Rather, she had great and powerful faith. I should mention at this point that in Mark's gospel, we, we read that when the woman touched Jesus' tassel, it says that he perceived that power had come out of him. That's fascinating. That's in Mark 5.30. So she touches it. He's walking. He's going to the official's house to help the daughter. And the woman touches the tassel and it says, he perceived power had left him. Intriguing. Jesus is such a well of healing as the son of God that to even touch his clothes in faith could heal any infirmity. Because he's so much healing in there that it's almost he can't help but heal if someone touched him in faith. Jesus declared to the woman that her faith had made her well. You know, faith can be a conduit between us and the Messiah, much like it was between the woman and Jesus. Our faith can connect us to Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying that her faith that this would happen, that that itself made her well, rather that it helped her connect to the power of Jesus, the power of Christ, and his power was able to flow into her. Think of electricity, just plugging in. Now she's connected. Our faith can do that too. If you connect in a real and personal way to Jesus, then the power of the Son of God can flow into you. In fact, yes, you can be miraculously healed, both physically and spiritually. And yes, is it true that it may not be part of God's plan in your life to heal you at that moment, or perhaps physically in your life at all? That may be the case, but you know what? Why not ask in faith since we're told to? He's ready to open us up to healing. If we come to him in faith, why not at least ask with expectancy? Because connecting to him can do miraculous things for us. And connecting to Jesus in faith, it can also empower you to boldly go and serve the Lord in this world in ways that are beyond yourself. So you might find that after you get close to Jesus in intimacy, you might have done some incredible things that you didn't think you could do. You might have led people to the Lord in a way that you thought, oh, I can't do that. And suddenly you find that you're so connected to the power of Christ that it's as if he's controlling you and causing you to do tremendous things. Let's continue with Matthew 23 through 24. 
When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said, Leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. Oh, laughing at anything Jesus said. That's the height of foolishness, isn't it? For all of his words are pure truth. And right now, I can't help but apply this to the current age. The world now mocks and laughs at the words of Christ. Very much a mockery. There are certain laws in Europe where you can't even publicly read certain passages in the Bible because it's seen as hate speech. So there's a hatred of God's word. There's a mockery of it. People misuse it. They use it for their own purposes out of context. But I want to assure you this morning, with every fiber of my being, they won't have the last laugh. Now, to be fair to the crowd, within their limited view of reality, so just with their limited experience, they were correct to say that the girl had died. She did die. And yet, Jesus said she was asleep. And you know why he said this? Because he could see the larger picture. He's not seeing things from a limited human perspective. He's seeing things from a perspective that only God has. And from his perspective, the girl was only asleep. That's because Jesus had the power to return her spirit to her body and wake her, so to speak. He could bring her back, wake her up. Later in the New Testament, how do we often see people who have died who are Christians? How are they often described? As being asleep, right? Paul will say things like, well, the, the, those who are asleep in Christ will be raised. And why does he use this word asleep? Because he's trying to emphasize they're not gone. In fact, their spirits with God, when someone dies who loves Jesus, your spirit goes to be with God in paradise, and eventually your body will be resurrected. And that's why we often see you'll be awakened, not brought back to life. You have eternal life with God, but there's this concept of just, just wake up. You're not dead. You're not gone. Dead seems to indicate, especially in the Bible, a disconnect from God. Because eternal life, as uh, Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, Rocky, uh, your favorite uh, Bible, chapter of the Bible. Remember in verse 3, um, Jesus says that this is eternal life, that you know God the Father and Jesus Christ. And you know Christ. So that is life. It's not what leads you to eternal life. So there's this idea, though, that those who are not gone are just asleep. That's a far better way, really, to describe a saved person who has passed away. Because they're alive forevermore. So if you want to describe their body in this current age, if they've died, I don't see them. So from my perspective, they're merely asleep. Their body is just asleep. And Jesus will awaken the bodies of all the saints when he returns and resurrects them. Let's continue with Matthew 25 through 26. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. This news spread throughout all that land. The crowds laughed at Jesus. And then our Lord simply took the girl by the hand and woke her up. In a very natural and casual way, Jesus brought this girl back to life. And in an age before newspapers, people throughout the land heard about Jesus resurrecting this young girl. Who's laughing now? Connecting with Jesus, getting close to him, shouldn't be something we did just to be saved. It's something we should make the top priority in our lives. Because when we connect with Jesus, he can pour power into us. He can pour new wine into us if we just make ourselves acceptable vessels, if we're willing to receive that power and we don't resist that power, or if we're not willing to contain it. And as disciples of Jesus, we should be open to the Holy Spirit filling us with new wine. The Lord has placed before us wonderful opportunities to serve him. Let's not allow ourselves to be inflexible old wine bags. Let's be open to the Spirit's leading. Let's be open to new wine 
to new power coming into our lives. Let's pray.